Good afternoon, and welcome back to our Arts and Entertainment Lecture Series. We're thrilled to have you join us once again for another captivating session with our dear friend, esteemed American composer, Sam Adler. For those who joined us in January, you'll remember Sam's gripping account of his early years in Mannheim, his harrowing escape from the Nazis during Kristallnacht, and his journey as a young musician in America. What was initially planned as a single program has blossomed into a series. And today marks the much anticipated second installment of this compelling four-part journey. For those of you joining us for the first time, it's worth noting that Sam is just two days away from celebrating his remarkable 96th birthday. A true luminary in the world of music, Sam Adler stands as one of the greatest composers and conductors of our time. With the daring spirit that has yielded over 400 published works, he has imparted his wisdom during a storied career spanning six decades at renowned institutions like Juilliard and Eastman. His recent album, To Speak to Our Time, performed by the acclaimed Gloria Day Cantores, and conducted by Richard Pugsley, garnered the American prize, adding yet another accolade to his illustrious career, which includes ASCAP's esteemed Aaron Copeland Lifetime Achievement Award. Yet, beyond his musical prowess, Sam is a masterful storyteller. Whether through his compositions or in conversation, his gift for captivating audience knows no bounds. Moreover, Sam serves as a bridge builder, fostering connections between individuals of diverse backgrounds, ages, and musical preferences. His book, Building Bridges with Music, Stories from a Composer's Life, is soon to be reintroduced by Paraclete Press, and it is a testament to his remarkable ability to unite hearts and minds through the power of music. Order information will be available at the very end of this discussion, so you'll have to stay till the very end. So without further ado, Sam, let's pick up where we left off. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here again, and I welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon or morning, whatever time it is in your zone. Um, and I hope that you all have had days like I have had, and that is days that completely change the direction and perhaps even the meaning of your life. Such a day I would like to start with today, and that is Christmas Day, 1951. I was a soldier, uh, as I've noted before, uh, at that time I was a, a corporal um, and my task in the army was uh, partially uh, as a part of a unit that was the artillery of our division, which was the second armored division, as well as spending three quarters of my time helping the chaplains do the services, uh, sometimes cleaning the chapel, uh, other times uh, doing the Jewish services, uh, since we had a very great shortage of uh, Jewish chaplains. We had a division of 24,000 men, uh, but uh, we did not have a, a Jewish chaplain for the 500 Jewish soldiers we had. And so therefore the chief chaplain in Heidelberg made me the Jewish chaplain, whatever that meant. Uh, it did mean I did services for Friday evening. At any rate, uh, that was my job in the army uh, up to this point. And the uh, Christmas day, 1951, changed everything in my life, the direction, the meaning, and other uh, chances for me to do things uh, that were completely unexpected. Now, let me tell you about that day. Well, it was uh, a very cloudy and very uh, snowy 
day in the little village where we were stationed. The name of it was Baumholder. Uh, there were 3,600 people in the town. And as, as, as I said before, 24,000 soldiers in the barracks. The uh, relationship between town and military was very tense at best. And I was very worried about it, even though I had begun something in town, and that is I founded a civic choir. It was mainly uh, made up of people from the Catholic and the Protestant church choirs. And we had prepared for Christmas that day uh, to perform the Christmas section of Handel's Messiah. Well, um, we were very worried because in the morning, I learned that in the hall where we were going to perform, which seated 2,800 people, there were less than 500 tickets sold by that morning. We were all worried that we were going to have a half empty hall at best. We were going to have to sort of staff it with military. Right. But we wanted, of course, to present it to the community. But tickets were very slow in selling. The, mostly the tickets were sold to the choir and their families. Well, the morning started as usual on every festival morning uh, with a seven o'clock Episcopal service where my choir, of course, sang. This was the Christmas morning service and the choir sang at the seven o'clock Episcopal service, the eight o'clock Catholic mass, the nine o'clock uh, Protestant, uh, all, all kinds of Protestant service uh, and another mass at 11 o'clock. After that, we had done those and they went very well. My choir at the chapel was just terrific. These kids uh, sang and learned music very quickly and uh, did a wonderful job in every service. Well, they all went to lunch and at one o'clock we decided to go downtown and uh, to Carol, which was unknown in Germany. Well, at first we were in the town square and we sang one carol and there were maybe 10 people there. All of a sudden, after we sang the first carol, people came from all directions and there were at the end about 500 people standing with us and the choir sang. Well, I thought I would teach them one carol in German. And uh, that carol was O Tannenbaum. And uh, of course, it was difficult because it says, O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, wie grün sind deine Blätter. Well, grün was hard for the GIs to say. They said sort of green, but that's okay. We sang. And after the third carol, people came up to the soldiers and threw their arms around them and said, we never knew that we were one. And this taught me the first lesson, that the Im immediate thing that will make better relations was to tell them that we are not very different from them. Love and that. this was a tremendous hit. I spoke to them in German and wished them a Merry Christmas. Uh, and more and more people came until the end, we ended with O Tannenbaum and they came up and threw their arms around all the soldiers. They did, our, our troops didn't know what to do. After all, <laughs> this had not been a good relationship. And now suddenly everybody loves everybody. So Pam, uh, Sam, Sam, so interesting, you know, context is the, the war had just ended six years earlier. You were only 23 years old, if my math is correct. That's right. It's, it's amazing. What it you're was doing. just a wonderful moment, which said to me, 
you've got to do if you really want good relations with these people you've got to show them that we are also in the same league so to speak and um I was hoping that it, the evening concert would do something well we were rewarded because by the end of two o'clock in the afternoon the entire house 28 seats were sold out so that uh, we we couldn't have anyone else uh to come to the concert well we had a rehearsal in the afternoon the false orchestra which was the local uh, that is the the state orchestra was our orchestra and uh we rehearsed in the afternoon and did the concert at night well you can imagine doing the services in the morning caroling in the afternoon rehearsal and then the concert I was exhausted well my there were I had several bosses and one of them was a very close friend or oh, we became very close friends father Pat who was the chief Catholic chaplain of our division and he said Sam look you did so much today uh I'm going to get you a pass and we will take your jeep and go along the river there's a river near Baumholder by the name of Naha N-A-H-E and this river uh has a distinction some of the best wines in Germany come from that river as a matter of fact Naha wines can be uh bought in the United States but they're very difficult to get because they only do a limited amount of winery uh, in that part and they're exceptionally good if you can pick up some n-a-h-e Naha wines they're wonderful and our uh Catholic chaplain loved to imbibe and so uh we took two nurses with us and went across the river and all along it uh having wonderful food some of these little towns have special restaurants that uh, specialize in the food of that area and it is wonderful and we had the best time <clears throat> and you know uh, I was a regular soldier I wasn't a chaplain or anything like that and I had to sign in in our orderly room at 10 o'clock at night well we got back and I signed in at one minute before 10. I was safe however the man in charge of our orderly room that night was our first sergeant whose name was Sergeant Moore I did not expect this and this was the first turn of events I walked in and he said Adler I won't use his profane language but he said Adler I hope you don't stay in this outfit very long because I almost lost my life because of you today and I hope you get the hell out of here very soon I said what what happened well what happened was this uh, you see the concert brought a very special thing to light and that is that a reporter for the German Associated Press which uh, sends stories to every major newspaper in Germany was at the concert and reviewed the concert and every major German paper the next day which is the second day of Christmas in Europe mm -hmm. every German newspaper had a headline Buchenwald and Dresden were forgotten well seventh army headquarters went berserk that never happened before so the general general Eddie at that time called our um Colonel Colonel Lowey and said what's going on this is unbelievable we never had such a thing happen in all the time after the war uh newspapers said saying that uh America is saving Germany and all this unbelievable that the the population loves the troops we've never heard of anything like that 
And he said, well, you know, we have a guy here and uh, he's uh, originally from Germany. He speaks the language and he's done a terrific job and so on and so forth. Well, General Eddie wanted to talk to me, which is very unusual. I mean, the general commanding everybody is not going to talk to a corporal. Yeah, you were just a kid. He yeah. made, and he made a mistake. He called our orderly room. Well, the first sergeant answered the phone and said, this is General Eddie's. Oh, yeah, what the heck? And he chewed him out and hung up. General <laughs> Eddie called back. Oh, and, the, and the first sergeant did the same. Well, three minutes later, Colonel Lowey came to our orderly room and said, Sergeant Moore, uh, did you just receive a call? He said, yeah, some idiot called and said it was General Eddie. He said, it was General Eddie. Well, I mean, he almost really lost his stripes. Uh, it, uh, you know, General Eddie doesn't call an orderly room. And so he was right. And the, the colonel forgave him and said, it's OK. But I, as soon as Adler gets back, I want to see him tomorrow. Hmm. Well, I went to see the colonel. And he said, Adler, I want you to do a concert again next week. I said, well, I mean, we can't do that. We, you know, we learned the, the Messiah and so on. And I said, what about Easter? He said, OK, we'll have a concert Easter Sunday. All right. Well, that was OK. So I taught the, you see, I, I'm a firm believer in doing the Christmas portion on Christmas and the Easter portion of the Messiah on Easter, because the text doesn't make any sense. I, I, I uh, love that. I love that. We, man we, came death and Jesus was just born. I mean, you can't do that. So right. uh, we prepared the Easter portion, which is not as long. And so I thought, well, maybe we can do some other music on the second part. And I learned that there were four Americans, a pianist, violinist, violist, and cellist, all professionals who were in the army, and they were going around to America houses to do um, concerts of chamber music. And they were very successful because they were very, very good. The pianist was Amo Capelli, and the others were uh, all major orchestra members before they were drafted. At any rate, um, the, the, the people in Stuttgart who were uh, the uh, keepers of, uh, of the uh, special forces, that is, uh, all the entertainment things were under one department. And um, they called and said, the four people want to play in the next concert. Well, I was able to get another orchestra, the Rhein Philharmonie, uh, to come to Baumholder to do the Easter concert. And uh, they agreed for me to come and do a rehearsal there in their uh, hometown. And Amo Capelli, I, I, I said to him, why don't you play the Rhapsody in Blue? After all, it's American piece. He said, no, 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 I want to play the Greek concerto. Well, OK. So uh, we went to rehearse with that orchestra. And it went very well. And he played the Greek concerto very well. And on Easter, they came to Baumholder. Between Christmas and Easter, I did whatever I could you know, to, to do my job. But uh, because of the shortage of Jewish chaplains, I was asked to uh, come to Heidelberg by the chief Jewish chaplain who had to go to Iceland to do two weddings, uh, to do the, seventh, the services for the seventh day of Passover. And I said I would do it. Um, and they said they would send a car to pick me up. That was very nice. Anyway, uh, we got to Easter. We did the concert, and this time we had to do it twice because we that did not only have 2,800 people, but we had them twice. So we did the Easter concert twice, and after the second, completely exhausted, the four members, uh, the, 
the piano quartet, and I went to the non-commissioned officers club and had a drink. And they said, Sam, what the heck are you trying to do? I said, well, look, we have to show the German population, no, the European population, that we have a culture. We don't have just GIs who never saw any concert or read any book, but we have a culture. You guys are from major orchestras. The only way we're going to do it is if we could possibly form an orchestra made, out of, made up of soldiers and go around and play music of the great composers and music of American composers here in Europe never heard. They said, well, do you think, do you think you could do it? I said, you're at special services in Stuttgart. You're the ones that could convince them that this could be done. He said, well, we'll try to do what we can. They not only tried, they did it. They went back to special services in Stuttgart and convinced them that I would be able to form an orchestra made up of soldiers uh, and really perform. Because if I had carte blanche, that is, if I had permission to go to the bands and get the best players and see if there are string players around and even uh, tap some places in the United States to get string players, we could form an orchestra. Unbelievably, they agreed. They said, Sam, we're going to get you off on the first, uh, uh, the last week of March. We'll send you around all of Europe to every, every part where there are American soldiers and you can see what you can find. Well, we found 68 players. And that was wonderful. And I made an enemy of every band director in Europe. I was going to say, I, I, I bet all the, I bet the band directors were hiding their best players from oh, you when they listen, heard you were in town. You see the the three trombones and the tuba. They yep. came to me at two o'clock in the uh, at night, woke me up in Frankfurt, and said, "We're from the Fourth Army Band, and we're going to be your tuba and and uh, trombone section." And they played till Eulenspiegel. And uh, I said, you're in. <laughs> Until Lloyd speak at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Oh, but the, the band director couldn't do anything because we, we made an agreement that uh, if I wanted them, I could have them. Well, you just saw a picture of the first meeting of the Seventh Army Symphony Orchestra. Love it. And I want to tell one other story because uh, uh, he's... You can't see him very well on this picture, but you can in the next picture. And that is we needed an officer. You see, no outfit could be without an officer. And I mean, I didn't know anybody. And when I went back after being in Stuttgart and getting there, okay, do you see that man right in front of the Christmas tree? Yes, that's, yes. That's his name is... Bill Doolittle, not the aviator, but Bill Doolittle. Uh, and I tell you the story. Uh, when I was back in my outfit, we went on maneuvers. And the French, who didn't calculate correctly and shot at us instead of the enemy, mm -hmm. uh, we, we had to jump into uh, some kind of a, a, a mud hole and I jumped into the the biggest mud hole there was so that I couldn't get hit. And the guy jumped next to me and he had two bars, which meant he was a captain. And um, I said, sir, isn't this terrible? And he looked at me and he said, don't call me, sir. I said, sir, you're a captain. He said, yeah. And he <laughs> he wiped the mud off his face and I recognized him as a schoolmate of mine at Boston University, Bill Doolittle, who was a wonderful cellist in the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. And I said, Bill, do you want to be the 
the uh, captain of the uh, Seventh Army Symphony. He said, of course, sign me up. Well, we were all set. So the last week in March of 1952, I was transferred from Baumholder to Stuttgart and all of the 68 men and one woman who was the wife of our pianist uh, assembled there. Um, we rehearsed from April 1st to April 29th, eight hours every day. You see, we didn't have the union to tell us we couldn't do it. Right. So we rehearsed all day long. And we learned about 70 works because these guys knew most of the repertoire and we learned a major American symphony to be played on every concert. Piston, William Schumann, uh, Roy Harris, uh, Aaron Copeland, and so on. So on the 29th of April, 52, we played our first concert in Heidelberg, which uh, was the headquarters of the European command. And the commander was General Dwight D. Eisenhower, mm. who uh, was going to retire that weekend to become the president of Columbia University. And afterwards, as we all know, the president, of the, United president States. of the United States. Well, he was in the audience with his entourage. And afterwards, and I can tell you what the program was. I still remember. We started off with a dance overture by Persichetti. The next piece was the Roy Harris Third Symphony. And after intermission, Brahms Symphony Number no. 2. Wonderful program. And my boys and girls played beautifully. Well, I went to the green room in this lovely auditorium in Heidelberg. And General Eisenhower, with his staff, came to congratulate me. And he was very laudable and said, uh, this is great. This is the best thing that's happened since the end of the war. What a wonderful thing to do, to go out and play this great music for an audience that I know will appreciate it. He said, but I don't like your uniform. Well, that was something. I wore an eye jacket like all of us, you know, like he wore. He said, this is not good for a conductor. You come to my office tomorrow and my tailor will make you a uniform that you should wear at every concert. And I went to his office at 10 o'clock sharp and his tailor was there and he made me a white general's uniform with corporal stripes, yes. which you can see in that picture. Yeah. Uh, do you want to show that picture? Yeah, let's put, let's put that picture back up again. Yeah. We'll okay. Well, it's a white uniform with, uh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. yeah. But I had to give it back, by the way. He made two of them, and I had to give both back for the next conductor. Oh, goodness. Yeah, that's okay. Anyway, Not everybody has, has, has Eisenhower's tailor as their uh, person who... That's right. <laughs> that's what you need. Uh, it, it was just a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And by the way, uh, uh, I, I did get a special uh, recommendation or uh, a special thing after I got out of the army, which uh, was sent to me by the, by the general who took over from General Eisenhower. At any rate, for the next three months, we did 90 concerts every night all over the place in every city of Germany and Austria. And it was a wonderful experience for a conductor, you know, who had conducted some concerts when I was a student at BU, when I was a student at Harvard. But this was a real orchestral tour. And we played, sometimes we had to play two concerts, a Pops concert and a regular concert. And we did all of that. So after the 90 concerts, the, the orchestra said, Sam, now look, 
you haven't given us a day off yet. Uh, let's take the next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and not play any concerts and we'll go. And we did that. Well, unfortunately, some people don't, you know, don't don't come back because of the, the train didn't come back and this. And we were having, I'll never forget, a concert in Augsburg, which is a rather large city, a beautiful hall in the opera house. And uh, we were again playing the Harris Symphony. And the Harris Symphony has something very important, and that is it has solos for the timpani. And you know what? Our timpani player got stuck in Frankfurt. So I walked across stage before about an hour before the concert, and I was so distraught. And a guy comes up to me and said, uh, uh, in a strange accent, um, I would like to join the Seventh Army Symphony. Uh, there are a lot of guys came up every concert, and we took some because I played the violin. We listened to him. We played okay, kind of. Uh, but most of them, I play the guitar, I play the ukulele, you know. Uh, and I said, well, what do you play? He said, I play the timpani. I said, oh. I well, said, is it, isn't that, that um, God himself providing you something? Yeah. He said, he you, knew. You, you, you play the timpani? And then I thought, oh, yeah, maybe he played the timpani. He said, yes, for the last two years, I was the timpanist of the Munich Opera. Well, he read that symphony. And of course, our poor GI symphony um, timpanist lost his job. Lost his job. Yeah, his name was Impolco, and he was a wonderful guy from Brooklyn. He played uh, percussion instead, which was fine. And this timpanist was first rate, you know, was a real pro. And you know, the army doesn't care about my knowing the score or not knowing the score. So I get a special service uh, telegram. Dear Sam, um, we're sending the orchestra to the first Mozart festival to be held after the war. It's in Passau, where Mozart himself conducted his three last operas, or except the three uh, uh, operas, uh, Cosi Fan Tutte, uh, Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni, uh, in German, in Passau. Well, I said, okay. He said, yes, and you're going to do Marriage of Figaro with an all-star cast from the Vienna Opera. I said, uh, and when is this? In five days. Well, I mean, I had heard Marriage of Figaro, but I have to conduct it in five days. And the star of it was going to be Domkraf Fassbender. Uh, maybe you remember Brigitte Fassbender, the great soprano of the Metropolitan and all over the world. Uh, it was her father, who was one of the most famous opera singers Germany has ever produced. He did all of those three Mozart operas as the star with the Böhm recordings in England. Well, <laughs> I tell you, I was a little worried. And he's, they, they, the telegram went on to say, you're gonna do a concert with a Greek pianist doing the Schumann concerto, and you're gonna do the Mozart, uh, Lord, uh, excuse me, the Haydn Lord Nelson mass at the Passau Cathedral on Sunday. <laughs> well, I'm five days away from this. They sent me a score overnight for the marriage of Figaro. And, you know, I mean, I know a few tunes from there, but uh, <laughs> I faked. And we went to Passau. I met with the cast, wonderful people from Vienna, except for Domka Fassbender, who was the most terrific singer and, of course, knew these operas backwards. In four languages, he had done it in, in Italian, in German, in French, and in English even. And uh, we had a rehearsal. Uh, 
Sitzprobe, which means they were sitting on stage. And we went through it with piano. The pianist who was going to be the harpsichordist was Kilmeyer, who was a German composer, a wonderful composer, and a terrific pianist and harpsichordist who could do anything, improvise, and so on. Well, we got through it. And everybody, I said, thank you very much. And, and Fassbender came over to me and said, Sam, you're a very nice guy, and I think you're quite a good conductor, but you don't know this piece. Oh, wow. <clears throat> he was right. Wow. Well, Mr. Fassbender and I spend four hours every single day between Monday and the first performance on Saturday studying this piece. And I want to tell you something. I don't know any opera as well as I do that opera. I love that. Because he really taught it to me. And we had a whole week of performances. Um, and it was just the most wonderful experience. We had a terrific uh, concert with, uh, with a Greek pianist doing a Schumann concerto. Uh, and uh, on Sunday at the cathedral, we did the Lord Nelson Mass with two of the greatest soloists I could imagine, Irmgard Seyfried and George London. My favorite bass baritone in all the world, I'm sorry to say he died quite early, but he was one of the great bass baritones. And those two soloists and a wonderful chorus with the orchestra did the Lord Nelson Mass, still one of my favorite pieces. Well, this was a great experience also for the orchestra because they were, after being in the hotel, for two nights after the concert, the mayor of Passau came and put us up in the castle. They made the castle ready for the entire orchestra. And uh, we went there and, and stayed uh, for, for the entire trip uh, in Passau. After that, it wasn't uh, that it was downhill. But this was a high point in the experience for these men yeah. and one woman. You know, we so, you know, to... No, go, I was going to say, Sam, what I appreciate so much about your musical journey is you always say, yes, I will do that. And even the day you don't know the score, I will learn it. And it will be just an extraordinary experience. So I, well, I, I, I think, thank you. I, I think this is... Uh, this is in my nature, I, I guess, and I've done it all my life, and I'm happy about it, even at 96, yeah. because uh, it, it leads to something, you know. If I had said, we can't do it, they would have found another orchestra. And this way, we made a point that we Americans can give something to this culture, which no other person can do. And by the way, the Mozart Festival in Passau is still going. We started it in 1952, and it's still going every year. I get a notice uh, that they're doing such and such. Um, and where, where we did, as I said before, I think, that uh, the Opera House was in the Bishop's Palace. And the opera house was the same house where Mozart himself conducted the German uh, perform first German performances of the three uh, Italian operas, uh, Cosi Fan Tutte, uh, Marriage of Figaro, and Don Giovanni. <clears throat> it was a great privilege. And uh, of course, it prepared me for something that's going to come up either late today or in the next lecture, and that is uh, my preparing to do opera later on in life. Yeah. Also for writing an opera or some operas later in life. At any rate, <clears throat> we continued on the tour. 
And um, I was supposed to get out of the army on the 10th of December, 1952. Well, we had also started something wonderful. And in those days, there was AFN, American Forces Network, which was uh, a bunch of radio stations all over Europe, actually having three hours of classical music every day. And one hour I organized with them was to feature the Seventh Army Symphony Orchestra. And so, because I wanted to show what I felt about these pieces, uh, we started every, every concert with the first movement, the first theme, the, that wonderful bubbly opening of the Italian Symphony of Mendelssohn. And we ended with the beginning of the Meisterbringer Prelude, bringing Mendelssohn and his uh, nemesis Wagner together in one program. Uh, I always felt that uh, Wagner was envious of Mendelssohn rather than hating it. But uh, we had a concert every week on AFN. <clears throat> and um, before I went home, they called me and said, look, Sam, we're going to keep you two more weeks and pay you $25 a day if you record a concert that we can have for the rest of this year and perhaps into next year. So I stayed. And instead of taking me home by ship, they actually flew me home in, <laughs> in a, uh, a plane that was not made for passengers. Oh, and Lord. It was, a hor it was on the 20th of December, and the, it was so wiggly woggly that everybody on the plane, except me, was sick. <laughs> the, there was an Air Force colonel next to me who uh, was sick all the way from Frankfurt to uh, uh, Massachusetts. Oh, anyway, goodness. and now another almost impossible thing happened. And that is, you see, while I was conducting, and as a matter of fact, Time Magazine ran a big article on the Seventh Army Symphony, and it came to the attention <clears throat> of the head of the department at uh, Brandeis University, who was my mentor at Harvard University, Irving Fine. And Irving wrote to me, at that time, Leonard Bernstein was conducting, get this, the band and the chorus at Brandeis University. This was before he went to New York. And uh, Irving wrote to me and said, look, Sam, we have a job for you. Lenny is going to New York, and I would like you to take over the band and the orchestra here, and the band and the chorus here, and maybe start an orchestra when we have enough string players. Well, I said, gee, I'm going home. I already have a job. Now another miracle happened. <clears throat> I landed in Massachusetts. Nobody knew that I was coming home. I went to Worcester, where my father was the cantor at Temple Manual, and my mother and sister Marianne uh, were home. My father, it was Saturday, was at the temple doing service. And I came in. They did not expect me. Nobody knew I was coming home because I couldn't tell them the date that I was coming home. That moment, a telephone rang. My mother answered the phone and said, Sam, it's for you. I couldn't believe it. And it was Rabbi Levi Ole, who was the rabbi in Dallas, Texas. He had been my father's best friend as the rabbi of his congregation in Worcester, Massachusetts. He had gone to Dallas because uh, Dallas was the most, the growing, really growing Jewish population, and was the rabbi, the cedar rabbi at Temple Emmanuel in Dallas, Texas. 
And he said, Sam, I don't have a job here, but I'd like you to come here because we're building a new building. And I want you to come here because I want the best music program of any synagogue in America. And I want you to tell my music committee how that could be. I don't have a job for you. And I'm not saying that you're going to come here. I just want you to talk to the music committee. I'm sending you a plane ticket and you come down. Well, okay. I had been in Dallas because, you know, I was stationed at Fort Hood and I had visited several times. And it was one of the big cities, Austin, the other one that was close to the base. So I went, I flew down. And uh, Rabbi Olin put me up in his house, and I had a meeting with the music committee. And there was a lady, Magda Foltz. I'll never forget her because she was quite influential in my later life. She was the chair of the committee, and she was a tough cookie. And I told them what I was could foresee. We have choirs. I, I love to call it from womb to tomb, from the third, fourth grade to uh, adult. And uh, uh, we could have concerts with orchestra, with the Dallas Symphony and so on. And she just listened and said, how much do you think this would cost? I said, I don't know, but we have to have a, a big budget. You decide. And she said, well, okay, I think you're too expensive for us. Okay, well, I didn't need a job. I already had a job, I thought. <clears throat> okay, I went back home. My mother said, uh, how was it? I said, oh, I had a good time, wonderful. I said, did I have a call? She said, yes, Irving Fine called. I said, yes. And I said, you already had a job in Dallas. Hmm. Thanks, Mom. Uh, that's my mother, you know. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. Well, she was right uh, that uh, Levi Olin had told her that if I do well with the committee, uh, he, he would hire me. Well, that's what happened. And uh, he called again and said, Sam, I have two things for you. <clears throat> you become music director of the temple, and we will do whatever you can get together. And also, there is a job open at Southern Methodist University to teach theory, and they are happy to have you. I was delighted. And my salary was $5,000 a year, which was okay. I could at least live. So um, I, um, I said, okay. Uh, I, I lost the job at Brandeis which was all for the good, by the way. Uh, and I uh, went down to Dallas. I bought myself a new red Chevrolet uh, with the money that I got from AFN uh, doing all those extra broadcasts. And I drove down. Well, the trip was very, very informative because, you know, there were no major highways like the Pennsylvania Turnpike or the New York Turnpike, you had to go all the roads, you know, those side roads. Well, I went along the lake and all the way through Ohio and all the way down to Texas, you know, Oklahoma, Texas. Yes, right down the center, right well, down the center. Well, uh, the uh, road led to Athens, Texas, uh, excuse me, Athens, Ohio. Well, Athens, Ohio is the home of the University of Ohio. And it was January, early January, and it was just letting out. In those days, you know, there were strange vacations around Christmas, and then uh, you went for a week, and then you let out, and so on. And everybody was laying out, and I was going very, a lot of traffic, and a lot of people on the sidewalk. <clears throat> and I never pick up a, a hitchhiker, but at the corner, at the red light, there was a guy standing there with a French horn, hitchhiking. 
So I thought, well, I mean, the French horn, you can't have a, a, a Tommy gun in the French horn. So I let him in and he said, oh, thank God. You, uh, I'm just going a hundred miles down the road. And I want to tell you, I'm the principal horn in the orchestra here and I'm shot. We played a concert Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and today is Thursday. Last night, we played a concert of brass choir music. And I tell you, we played a piece by a guy who should never write for brass because he doesn't know how to write for brass. So I said, oh, really? I'm interested in what, oh, he said, you never heard of this composer. I never did either. But I want to tell you, we played this piece and it has a high C in it and everything. I'm telling you, I'm shot. So I said, I'm really interested in, in what piece you, you played. So he said, well, uh, it was called the uh, concert piece by Samuel Adler. And I said, that's me. And well, he didn't, at first he what didn't. What are the chances? What are the yeah, chances said, of that? He said, he said uh, what did you say? He said, I'm Sam Adler. He said, oh no, that can't be, that can't be. So I said, yeah. Uh, that's me. And I said, I'll sing the tune for you. And I did. And he almost jumped out of the car. Well, I mean, you know, he could say, I, I played a piece by Beethoven. I'm Beethoven. I mean, I'm, when do you get that? Well, I'll tell you, that was quite a revelation. I, uh, I went on and um, got to Dallas. I had a shock along the way. You know, in those days, there was a great deal of segregation. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, things were not too good yeah. uh, between the races. And I was shocked coming from the North to go through a town by the name of Commerce, Texas. It had a big sign, Commerce, Texas, the whitest people and the blackest earth. I said, gee, gee, that's really something to get this kind of relationship. Well, I went to Dallas, I found myself an apartment, and it was the time uh, the uh, Temple Emanuel was in the south end of town. <clears throat> it was a Moorish kind of building, very nice, and seated about a thousand people. It had the choir and the loft uh, right above the uh, Torah ark. And um, Rabbi Olin didn't like the choir to be seen, so he put a curtain up. But on Saturday morning, they had a sisterhood choir. And the sisterhood ladies insisted on being seen because they had wore new hats and so on and so forth. And so they always opened the curtain. Well, he didn't like that and said, Wait, the first thing I want you to do is to form a children's choir and they're going to sing on Saturday morning and nobody's going to see them. And they're going to concentrate on the prayers instead of the hats. And this was my first introduction to services at Temple Manual in Dallas. We had a professional double quartet, excellent singers. They all taught at either the University of North Texas or SMU. They were excellent singers and a maiden lady organist who uh, <clears throat> was okay. Not bad, not good, but okay. She always played a few wrong notes, but they were always nice notes. <laughs> so, so we started, and of course, they did very traditional reform Jewish music. Uh, that is uh, music of the Southern reform. You see, when the Jews in the 19th century came from Germany to America, they brought music of the Reform Synagogue of Germany to America. And America uh, took this music to heart. And it, it was really very beautiful, 
but very 19th century sort of, I would say the harmony sounds like not too good Mendelssohn, mm. but there was one very good, two very good composers, Lewandowski and Sulzer. And in America, uh, there were reformed congregations. The reform movement started really in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, with one of the rabbis there, and also the the uh, reform college is there now, the Hebrew Union College, and um, spread especially in the south and southwest, where Jews landed in Savannah or in Charleston and went across. For instance, Dallas was founded by two Jewish families, which is very little known, but the, the Neemans and the Marcuses, you all know the name from yes, of course. the store, uh, and the Sangers came from Germany, uh, landed in, I think it was Savannah, and came across and, and uh, settled in Dallas. And so I think I will leave it at that, yeah. and uh, we'll start in the Dallas situation the next time, because I think I'm right there, except let's uh, ask, we have about three minutes, maybe somebody has an urgent question. Yeah, the, the, the one question I had, Sam, is while you had such conducting while you were in the army, how did you ever find time to compose outrageous brass music that they, the horn player was complaining about? Where did you ever glad find you, the time? I'm so glad you asked that. When I was an undergraduate at Boston University, I had a girlfriend who was a horn player. Well, um, I uh, wrote a piece, my oh, and my theory professor, Robert King, yeah. was a very famous euphonium player. And he founded a publishing house called Robert King Music, Music for Brass. And um, he said, Sam, why don't you um, write a piece for the brass choir? And uh, I'll publish it. So I, over the weekend, wrote a piece called Concert Piece for Brass. And uh, I brought it in and he said, well, it's summer course. Uh, we don't have enough brass players. Come in September and we'll have a full brass choir. Well, I went there in September and I looked at the brass choir, which was very large. And the principal horn was this very beautiful blonde. I took one look at her and I lost complete, <laughs> <laughs> my attention span was gone. But I got through the piece and it was the concert piece for brass. And the only thing she said afterwards was, Mr. Adler, I like this piece very much, but don't write any more high thieves for the horn. <laughs> well, ever since then I've, Tried not to write, <laughs> but you know, you. I wrote three pieces for the brass choir. I wrote a piece for two trumpets and if it, all this brass music to uh, get into her good graces and for her recital. I wrote my first horn sonata, which I'm afraid is still one of my most performed pieces. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I, I just, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us here at Arts Empowering Life. And I, I want to uh, let people know if you haven't seen the first talk that we did a month ago, you can go on the um, artsempoweringlife.org website, look up lecture series, and you'll see that one. This one will be there, and we're going to talk um, next month in April. We're going to talk, probably take you from Texas through Juilliard, through Eastman, so many stories. And, and I, I want to um, also put up now, probably at, at the end of it, I'm going to put up the, the new cover of your book, which is being reissued. Building Bridges with Music, Stories from a Composer's Life. And we'll put up order information. People can um, do advance uh, pre-publication orders now. Hopefully by the time we do our final one, there'll be hundreds sold. <laughs> there'll be a hundred sold. That's the goal, Sam, at least. Yeah. At least a hundred sold. The QR code works there, but. I thank I, you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure again. Thank you so much. Blessings, Sam. We'll look forward to next month. Thank look you. Look forward to next month. Bye-bye. We'll Bye-bye.